when we register at a art course or something. Most people look at my wife and think she's the artist, and I work on the rigs, you know, <laughs> so. <laughs> I went down to that, uh, I think it's the Sunrise Gallery in West Edmonton Mall. And uh, there was these paintings there. So I said to the guy, I said, man, I'd, re I'd really like to paint like that. The guy said, oh, I don't know, some guy in town here, I think he has lessons, you know. So I phoned Greg up and Greg said, well, I'm all full up, you know, in the fall. And I said, oh, you know, I'm this rural GP and I'm working all the time and blah 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 and I can wind enough and he finally said okay come along so that's how it started. I probably have I don't know four or five hundred books on painting but you know if you're interested in something you might as well do it. You know? I took it up for relaxation now I want the paintings to turn out well. You know, like, so I'm not just not out there filling time. I want that painting to be successful. So I want to be good at it, you know. If I can't be good at it, I, I well, I, I don't quit. I usually work harder. I think that's who they choose in medicine. They don't choose people that, you know, that aren't pretty driven. In medicine, and certainly in rural medicine, we are extremely privileged in that we have the opportunity for people to tell us their innermost secrets, and we really have an ability to make a difference in their life. And we can actually see that. You know, we can see them out in the street. We can see that, that kid that we delivered. You know, so we, we know that we're doing something. It, 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 so I, to me, it's just, you know, really rewarding. Thank you. Okay. Are we playing for money or what are we doing here? I've been here 35 years, so my patients have sort of grown old with me. It's very rewarding in that way that you, you know, can look after these people that long. And you, you, you aren't having any pain? No. Nope. Okay. And you'd tell me, right? Yes. <laughs> and uh, a little, uh, I don't know, disheartening also because you see them going downhill. I mean, you'll see farmers that were very strong and, and, and now they're, you know, just able to kind of get around the hallways. And so it's, uh, it, but th that's part of life, you know. Look at the camera, smile for the camera. You know, when you're a little kid and they say, oh, if something's bad, just go tell a teacher and an adult you trust. Right? Well, you know, I think that he really provides for this community as, you know, any good doctor would, you know, for the, for the adults, that he's that adult you trust, you know. Here we go. And we'll go see the birdies, right? Uh, I, I don't think you could, well, I know you can't practice medicine in any community if you don't have your wife's support. Okay, go see the birdies. Okay, let's go look at the birdies. She just understands the life. Okay, we're ready to go see the sheep. I know when I come home from the office, um, Lynn just kind of leaves me alone for half an hour usually. Sheep, sheep because I, I have to kind of get unwound a bit and so I'll sit down and read or I'll do something. Here, come and pet the sheep. Do you want to pet the sheep? I can't imagine existing without somebody that, you know, like my wife. I mean, you, you just couldn't do it, I don't think. have always in this town worked in one clinic. Goodwill is, uh, is a relationship of trust. Uh, you never build that up uh, in a practice where you see a high turnover of people that you don't see again. <laughs> don't worry. Well, we're three at the moment. The one is a lady. <laughs> a lady musketeer then. 
the lady doctor in town. Yeah, it's it's quite the concept around here. It's, it's, it's a bit challenging, I think, for some of the people around here to have a, a female physician, but it's a welcome change for many, many people as well because the options are always there in the city to have a female physician, and uh, and uh, it's good that I can, can provide that service. Well, uh, we work as a team. Basically, uh, that, that sums it up uh, 100%. You have to be collegial and you have to support each other. It's daunting sometimes to, uh, to practice in the, uh, uh, in the rural setting. You have to have that personality that wants to be challenged, I suppose, all the time. He's been here for more than 30 years and it's hard to get doctors to go to rural areas. For this award of distinction, there has to be a basis of um, commitment and, and uh, knowledge that has to be there and definitely he has that. They trust you for uh, your credentials, but um, uh, goodwill is something much deeper and is developed uh, uh, and earned over a long period of time. And I think that's probably why uh, he got nominated, and it's, uh, I think it's a really good thing for him. <laughs> The nursing staff, you have to trust them. If you're in a small town, you, you've got to trust the nursing staff. And you've got to trust when they tell you Mrs. So-and-so I think is sick, you know, and I think you, you should come over and have a look, you, you got to go. You know, you can't say, ah, oh, whatever. So the, it, it has to work that way. He's my personal doctor, he's my employer, and he's also a, a wonderful friend. My husband and my marriage fell apart. So, uh, I, I was handling my pain by drinking. Tom was the one who, uh, who I, I vented to, who I let everything out to, who I could cry in front of. He said, I know you're having a really rough time and I, I hate to kick you when you're down, but he said, I think you have to go to ADAC. If anything, I guess it showed me that he cared enough about me save me from myself. I've been abandoned by the Anytime I've seen him emerge, he's he's always that very calm element which helps. Personally I tend to get very emotional and especially if it's someone that I know I have to just stand back and slow down. He's uh, always been a calming factor in an emergency situation. He will stand back and you can tell he's just thinking of uh, what needs to be done for this patient. Here we go, Needle. He's a good guy to talk to and uh, uh, bring us back to where we need to be. There are times when you're doing it that you're so extremely challenged that you really wonder, you know, why did I ever think of this? But when you sort of get through those challenges and, and things turn out reasonably well, you think, oh man, that was good. Like this is, that was exciting. That was, that was great, you know? And so you always feel, you know, you always feel up. lady in the glasses. Congratulations. <laughs> Long time coming. Equally that I have people that, that I have done well with. I also have people in the community that I know I haven't done as well with. And they're also out there walking around. You know, and so there is that reminder that, you know, <laughs> maybe. No, I don't do autographs. <laughs> I, I already shook your hand like four or five times, haven't I? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I only do it once. <laughs> like, I'll never wash his hand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not used to all this <laughs> hugging, <laughs> hugging and carrying no, on. Well. A crowd? Yeah. No. We'll do a crowd shot. <laughs> oh, okay. Bev said a few people, I'm absolutely overwhelmed. Isn't this incredible? He told me, he said, put the coffee on. He said, at 9.30, I'll be home right after my house call. 
No. Did no you idea. Think he, uh, he doesn't like. He's not crying or anything. No, he just about though. Oh, yeah. When he came out, he was pretty. Uh, one of the ladies said, "Just about." Yeah, yeah, just about. Yeah. No, this is pretty spectacular. This is wonderful. Do you think he probably delivered a lot of these kids here? I just think we can make such a change. You know, all of those people we saw today, in some way, you know, you've worked with them and you've helped them and. Um, you know, there are some that you, as I say, you'd like to have helped more or done better with. Thank God I don't have to, but uh, I don't have to sign but we're constantly being reminded of what we do. That's what makes it, I think, so challenging, and that's what makes it so rewarding. I mean, if those rewards aren't there, then it, you know, why would you want to work here? <laughs> Probably you can be a little bit crusty now and again. Oh, I don't even have a stethoscope. Jesus, Murphy. I don't need one. Okay. I had been told that he was quite an ogre. And I used to bitch and complain about the figure skaters all the time. <laughs> and he got less ice for it. He's a voracious reader. He reads all kinds of stuff. Well, yeah, he's a know-it-all. Not that he acts like a know-it-all, but he does know a lot of stuff. He likes to likes to try things. He's, he's racing the sheep to cut the grass. He just whistles. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it is. No, no, you don't, you don't, don't eat the lambs. No. I played and he coached. You know, he is an ordinary guy with lots of talent, and of course he is a doctor. And he used to tell us we were getting too fat. <laughs> Wasn't that it? Yeah. They're putting on a little bit of weight there. <laughs> There's not too many people that can um, keep up to uh, the tone skiing in the, in the bush. That was good. I got out because he was the coach. <laughs> no. Lots of, we've come back bleeding, bleeding more than once. And I found out that he was a lot less like an ogre than had been described. Am I still on camera? <laughs> He never pushed me into medicine, but he always knew I was interested in it. And he took the extra time to talk to me about it, to answer any questions I had, which I had a lot. You know, how do you go about getting into medicine? What's important? What makes a good doctor? And he was able to help me answer all of those questions. He said to me, you know, why do you want to be a specialist? And what, what is it that attracts you to that? And I told him that I wanted to know a lot about one thing. And he said, well, why wouldn't you want to know a lot about everything? And from there, I just, I just explored it, and, and that's what turned me right over to family medicine. So, I think that if you're a professional, you should teach. And, and I think that teaching is a, is a big part of what I do. 8.2, 7.5, 5.7, so they're, they're actually all good. good. When I was a student, they just turned you loose in the ward. And I did lots of physical exams, didn't even know what I was doing. You know, but now we can say to the student, okay, you know, do you feel that? That's too hard. That's that's cancer. And okay, did you remember that one we felt yesterday? It was soft. It was rubbery. Well, we'd like to that that's normal. You know, so it, it's just a much better method, I think, than than what I had to sort of struggle through. We'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Mr. Newman has some neck stiffness, and we haven't really, he hasn't really been satisfied with the way we've been treating him. And he told us that the only thing that works for him is um, uh, this ointment that he gets from the veterinary clinic that is labeled for stud horses only or something like that. But so far we've declined to treat him with that. First of all, as medical students, we uh, are just constantly lying all the time. Whereas the most important lesson that we have to learn is always to be truthful. What I want to do is expose them to the patients. Someone says, oh, put your stethoscope on this guy's chest. Do you hear that murmur? And after standing there for about 30 seconds and all you hear is the kind of friction of your fingers on the stethoscope, you go, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I hear that. You know how to take a, 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 good, a good history from them quickly, you know, get the facts. You're just like constantly faking that you know things because everyone else is so brilliant and you, you know you don't know anything right try and teach them how to think you know how to how to sort of work your way through a problem you don't know what's going on um, and so I thought well 
okay, I have to not be like this at all. There is some logic to medicine that it isn't just, you know, you just sit down and write out all these orders and they come to you by, I don't know, divine guidance or something. Very early on, Dr. Phillips said, well, you know, what do you think about this? Um, is that a is that an appropriate blood sugar for this patient who has this and this condition or whatever? And I said, I have no idea. And he said, that's right. <laughs> and so there are certain things that, at least in my mind, you have to know 100%. And it's, it's not good enough if they only know 98% of that. It's got to be 100%, and we'll keep working away until till we get that 100%. Not only as a doctor does he care about making people well, but also he cares about these people as members of his community. Of course, he wasn't being sort of the way that they kind of teach you to be in school when you, because you learn about breaking bad news to people, uh, you know, in, in school. And he wasn't, I was sort of thinking, thinking back to the checklist of things that you're supposed to make sure to say or do, and I, I wasn't, he wasn't really syncing up too, way, too much with the way that he was, he was saying it, but at the end, the patient said, the, you know, before we left, she just said, Doctor, uh, thank you for being so gentle. That, it was really important to me how you did that. Whenever you get way too full of yourself, you know, and you're thinking, oh man, am I, was I brilliant on this one? You just wait a week. You know, and there, you'll be getting your comeuppance, and and you'll get it almost for sure. He cared for my parents until they were in their 90s. And then my husband was very, very ill, and he saw him on a weekly, daily basis. And now he's under the third generation, so he certainly knows our medical history and our idiosyncrasies. <laughs> and we just get along great. And your diet's been okay? Yeah, well, he helps me coping, especially with the, uh, my loss of vision is quite traumatic, and he certainly is a, a comfort and a, well, he understands somehow or other. I can talk to him about it. We don't allow you to fraternize with the medical students. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to persuade him to come back. Some things are just unchangeable, like my vision, for instance. So you can get disappointed, but real, realistically, you know that they can't do very much about it. So you have to learn to uh, cope. But it helps if somebody's there to support you. He's sensitive to all of the aspects of of this person's identity, right? Not just the aspect that's obvious when they come into the emergency room. He really is a very conscientious man, and, he's, and he, he does a beautiful job with these interns that come in. He really likes to teach, I think, and we really appreciate that, too. Even though if you ask him, well, what do you think about this new trend of um, uh, treating people, asking about their socioeconomic situation and their biopsychosocial status, he'd say, well, that's bullshit. I don't believe in that at all. But then when you see him practicing, he's constantly uh, exercising uh, his ability to integrate their lives and their, med and their medical needs. He's, he's, not about, he's not above putting his arm around you and saying, you know, we understand. I think they just have faith. After so many years of him serving them and him serving the community, I don't think they can really imagine any other scenario besides just that he really does care to help people. This is Dr. Krause. He's a medical oh, student medical from the university. Student. That's me. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here. I basically didn't really have fear. I knew I was going to fight it one way or the other. Just get me to the hospital so I could have the surgery. My biggest fear was the waiting. And so, that's, I think, yeah, problem. and so one of the things you And I needed to have this surgery within three to four weeks because yeah, my stint would fail it. again. That was Man, in my bile yeah. duct. And when I called to ask her what was happening, she said, in the big scheme of things, you probably will not have surgery till January, February. And I started to cry and I said to her, I probably won't be alive by then and I won't need the surgery. And I hung up on her and I came to see Tom the next day. But he got me in. 
three days later I had a call and I was to be in Edmonton. It was a very hard protocol. <laughs> it's a tough, tough, tough thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know how he did it. And so they can run into a number of problems. The first thing is they have this blind loop, mm. and that blind loop. He's like my hero. <laughs> like he really is. He and deserves the rural the physician of the year for sure, because he goes out of his way. I made my grid. Oh, good. Yeah, I did. Oh, good. So I we'll sat on the deck yesterday and made it. We'll be ready to roll. We'll be just ready to roll. Good. Perfect. Really. And then I gritted my paper, just kind of oh, the same, good. so, because that's what he said. So, You're going to have lots of water. Yeah, I want lots of water because I want lots of reflection. Yeah. Okay. I enjoy it. It's a night out That's a nice in the nature and birds and excuse to get out. visit with the ladies. And he was telling the rest of them, he says, Mary was there before the mountains, you know. so hard to get any production out of this group. Oh, that was behind us. Huh? Are we quitting or what are we doing? Look at that, it's not even raining. This is going to be good.